do people come from? Well, I think um, the education is really the legacy. Uh, the long-lasting legacy is the people you've trained and people who they go on to train. Uh, right here at Vail, for instance, um, there are two generations of residents that are trained. Um, one um, is attending Vail, uh, trainee at the University of Texas, and one of uh, a trainee uh, at the University of Colorado. So these are um, um, both gratifying and I think meaningful in terms of uh, impact upon the profession and upon patients. It must be wonderful to run into them year after year and see, you see the evidence of, of the influence that you've had. Well, I, I've also had the opportunity of uh, working with fellows of fellows, so I consider them my grandfellows. And tell us a little bit, like, are there any individuals that you want to call out that would be good? Like I'm thinking of the De La Garza's or were you, were you the residency director for Suzanne or was she before, she was Colorado before you joined? Uh, of Chris? Yeah. Um, actually, no. Uh, Chris, Chris started the residency in San Antonio um, when I was no longer the residency fellow. I was sort of at the end of my time there. But um, of um, the fellows I've trained, I think um, many of them, um, have gone on to positions of leadership, and that adds a very special sense of uh, gratification and a way of magnifying uh, the impact of what you do. Any great teaching moments you want to share? Well, actually, I'll, I'll turn that a bit by saying that in the last few years, um, how I teach uh, has changed. Um, I think one of my favorite things has always been to teach in small group settings particularly at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning um, uh, on uh, board rounds. I particularly uh, like that. And how my uh, teaching has changed is uh, to make it much more interactive, uh, to make the teaching um, uh, much more clinically set. Um, for my time as Associate Dean for Continuing Medical Education, in that circumstance I learned, for example, that the high impact kind of continuing medical education is that which is interactive and performance based. So I'm going to have a good time this afternoon here with an example of that. So you have the immediate audience response. And Alan, Alan always credits you with the, um, the important teaching moment when we were all playing Australian doubles and he kept smashing the ball over the net and you took him aside and said, don't be a schmuck. <laughs> He's used that line. <laughs> <a number> of <laughs> people. It's one of the many reasons I love Alan. <laughs> so Jane, th these are for you. What drives your commitment to the care of women and infants? I lived at the cusp of, I became an adult at the cusp of women's rights. The introduction of the birth control pill, women being able to control their fertility. And this has made a marked difference in women's lives. When women can control the, the number of children they have and be, have healthier children, this allows them to do things other that they would like. Doctors, lawyers, teachers, mothers. Mothers still the best job in the whole world. But it gives women a choice. And we can't take that choice away. We can't go backwards. Um, I've seen the difference. I taught students who didn't know how they got pregnant. I was able to start a course in sex education in the high school where I taught in Philadelphia. It was one of the first. And it's been my passion ever since. And it makes for healthier babies. It makes for healthier women. It makes for healthier lives. Awesome. Um, so for both of you, Ron, you can go first. Who are your, who are your role models and how did they inspire you? Um, I, I think over my career I've been very fortunate in having three or four role models. Uh, the first was uh, Dick Schwartz, who was uh, professor head of maternal fetal medicine at Penn when I was a, a resident. Uh, he's been a lifelong uh, role model and friend. Um, when I was on the faculty at the University of uh, Texas, um, there were two who were very uh, instrumental in forming my career. Uh, 
Joe Seichik, who was the first chair, and Carl Powerstein, who was the second chair. And then when I arrived here, I had the great pleasure of getting to know Dr. E. Stuart Taylor on a personal basis. And those four um, have been my role models, people I emulate in terms of uh, trying to um, think about how I relate to people and style uh, of teaching, style of relating to patients. And we talked about this a little bit at lunch, so we were talking about the job of the First Lady, but in, in your various roles in life, you have taken on quite a bit of entertaining and hostessing skills, yet maintained a pretty impressive political profile. Um, talk to us a little bit about your approach to entertaining and hostessing. Making people feel at home, making people feel they're important, not not stuffy, that, that when they come into my home, they should feel accepted and welcome and a part of our family. And many of them have become a part of our family, including you and your husband. And, and we feel very attached to the people. I feel very attached to the department. I became, Ron became a part of the department um, when it was very small. It's bigger now. You've made it bigger still. Um, it's important. but but it meant a lot to me for him to succeed. And I feel that in some ways I help with that. I never hired anyone unless they had Jane's stamp of approval. And I made a few <laughs> suggestions that he hadn't thought of about hiring people, and they worked out well. So um, I felt like it was, I had a lot to do and it was my department too. I hope nobody finds that offensive. I don't think so. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you a follow-up one about CGOS, but let's let's. I want to go into some of the other ones. So, for Ron, how did you identify infectious disease as a career and a research focus? It was a very singular moment. It came out of a journal club when I was a second-year resident. Um, I was assigned an article at Dick Schwartz's hands. It was the first article about prophylactic antibiotics in cesarean section. At that time, the common wisdom was that prophylactic antibiotics would be a bad idea, and methodologically, this was a very bad paper, yet it was published in um, one of the major uh, U.S. Uh, obstetric gynecology journals. So I tore it apart at the journal club, and I said, well, there's one thing that we should do, and that is do a trial to demonstrate that prophylactic antibiotics don't work. And uh, my two co-authors in that were Dick Schwartz and Dr. Alan DeTrini. Great. And so for, this one's for both of you. I want both of your perspectives. Um, because many people may not fully realize the degree of your math fetish. When did it start and uh, what, what fueled that? Uh, Can I answer that? <laughs> well, yeah, you're going to get a chance to, because you, you've left with it. No, it's, I started it. informed your home decoration. Okay. I started it. So why don't you start? I was looking for a present to give Ron for a birthday, that something he would like, and he wasn't into expensive sports or expensive cars or cameras or tech stuff. And I stumbled on to getting, I was in Philadelphia uh, to attend a meeting in Washington, and Somehow the idea of a map about the American Revolution, his hobby, uh, was suggested to me. Ron's father may have been the one to suggest it. And there was a famous map dealer that was in Philadelphia and I went and I chose some antique maps with the understanding I could return them if he didn't want them. And that was it. Uh, the map uh, interest grew out of my boyhood interest in American history having been a son of Philadelphia. Um, and with so much of American history starting there, it was just a, a, a natural. So Jane really did start uh, the collection. It was for my 40th birthday, and we have had a partnership in building uh, the collection. And I think, Lynette, you don't even know this, but uh, just in December, I had my first peer-reviewed cartography article published. In an international journal. 
That's great. And, and I have to add that it's my collection too, because some of them were on display one time at the um, Denver History and Science Museum, and uh, somebody walked in, the OBGYN Society was meeting there for their December meeting, and he said, and here's maps from Ron's collection that he's donated to the museum. I said, number one, they're not donated, and number two, they're mine also. <laughs> And uh, I would be remiss if we didn't discuss your pirate fetish. <laughs> when did it start? <laughs> well, well, the, well, well, that was uh, relatively recent. Actually, um, we went to the wedding uh, celebration of uh, Camille, Camille. Ha uh, Camille Hoffman's uh, a wedding celebration, and it happened to be at uh, Halloween. So we were walking through Cherry Creek, and we went to the... Uh, a Halloween store, and I bought my pirate costume. Jane got her pirate costume, and there have been dozens and dozens of opportunities when we've been able to either go as pirates or as George Washington. And do you want to talk a little bit about the historical fiction that you, um, you know, what's the status of your, your book? Oh, this is one of uh, my uh, projects that I'm working on since we've uh, uh, since we moved actually started working on it about uh, five years ago and it's been an idea in the making it's a historical a revisionist history of the American uh, Revolution and um, the major reason I'm writing it is because I get great pleasure out of it um, I think the prospects for commercial publication are about nil but thanks to the opportunities of self-publication in that you will get a copy and you can use it as a doorstop or whatever you would like to do with it. <laughs> okay, and one more for Jane. Um, so you, you were a secretary for the Colorado Gynecologic and Obstetric Society for a number of years. And, about um, 15 to 18 years. Tell, tell, tell us a little more about your role and well, what you I, liked about it. I started out as a volunteer when the society was doing a project to educate students in classrooms about any inf gynecologic information they wanted to hear. And I would set up the meetings, um, deliver posters that they had produced to all the schools. I learned my way around Denver and the suburbs. And then um, Harvey Cohen asked me, uh, this project needed continuing and the woman who had done it was retiring or moving and so he said would you finish it so I said I'd be happy to and then they wanted to replace her and I said can I apply for the job and um, the somebody in the on the board said well how can we pay her when her husband's going to be president in the group and they said oh it was okay for her to work for nothing now you won't pay her so they hired me and then the treasurer retired so I became the executive director and did all the ends of it setting up meetings Etc. Yeah, getting people to testify at the legislature um, on women's issues. So that continued my interest in women's health. Great. Um, any other stuff that you guys want to say? Do you want to play it back to make sure we have okay sound? <laughs> 